Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. Neil and Rob, how are you? I noticed you've had a pretty fun morning there, so um, good to hear that uh, it's not all doom and gloom at the moment. That's what we're here for. That's what it's all about. I might turn Rob on, if you'll pardon the expression. Uh, <laughs> we, we, try, we try and have a little bit of uh, fun, Dan, and very nice of you to tune in and get a feel for what's uh, going to greet you when you come on the line to promote another part of uh, the body of work that you've produced writing about uh, footy stuff along the journey, the life and times of the late, great Peter Crimmins, um, an enjoyable task for you? Yeah, for the most part it was, yeah. Obviously there's the tragic uh, twist at the end, unfortunately, with Peter's story, but um, it was just a privilege to to write the, uh, to research the story and to meet so many of Peter's family, including his wife Gwen and their two boys, Ben and Sam, and, and Gwen's other daughter, Amber. Uh, it was fantastic to be welcomed into the family and um, yeah, there's so many funny stories about Crimo, so I made sure we got all of them in there. There's, there's a few wacky ones where you, people will shake their heads and, and laugh out loud, I hope. So it is, it, uh, he was just a fun, effervescent um, person to be around. Before we get on to the actual story and the book itself, I'm fascinated by the process. So you're a person who's is an author, and you've written, f- I think, five other books along the way. How does How do you go from that to being the author of the the Peter Crimmins story? Does someone approach you? Do you approach them? Who comes up with the idea? How do you get started? What's the process? Book number 12 now. Okay, it's only got five listed in the the thing I'm looking at. Yeah, yeah, no, six of my own now and uh, six co-written. So ah. I've been really fortunate to turn a few out over the last few years. The um, process for me, um, I probably am the most um, unconventional author in history so there's no system there's, there's no, it uh, sounds like a radio program yes come, yeah, yeah, yeah. it comes from the heart and the head and i find inspiration somewhere and i um i go at it hell for leather and i'm very fortunate uh, jeff slattery my publisher is, is open to most of my ideas and and this was one of them and um i'd i'd been fascinated by crimo as a young boy uh growing up interested in footy history and um the peter crimin story really um captivated me and um, it was, it was yeah, a few years later, I'm sitting across from Gwen Crimmins asking her about her time at Hawthorne and, and the emotion was still really raw um, for, for her in reliving her life with Peter. So we realised then that it was time that Peter's story was told. So um, I was privileged to be in the right place at the right time and, I yeah, I, I, was, I was very fortunate that the family felt willing to open up to me. Because it's 45 years. That's... That's the staggering thing since he passed away. It's well, 44 years, yeah. So it's a story that, as you say, is still full of raw emotion, and yet, you know, it, it's something that happened so long ago. It obviously was a, a critical um, person in, in a, well, VFL football as it was in those days, but particularly the Hawthorne Footy Club. Yeah, he was probably one of the most popular players in the competition. Everyone loved him, even opponents. So I interviewed Kevin Murray, the, the 1969 Brownlow medalist who happens to be best friends with Peter's brother Barry Crimmins today and um, I asked Kevin about playing against Hawthorne and he said there was one day at Glenfrey Oval he rammed Crimo into the fence and the crowd bayed for his blood so um, Kevin quickly knelt down and picked him up which he would rarely do with an opponent because he just felt felt bad um, daring to knock over the <laughs> the, the popular Peter Crimmins in, on his home turf so that was the that was the sort of feeling that um, opponents had for him. They, he was a mighty competitor and he gave no inch. And uh, Kevin Sheedy had some great tussles with him in the back pocket as well. But um, but you couldn't help but admire him because he was just such a positive bloke to be around. I tell you what, when you write the Kevin Murray story, I will be in the queue to buy the first one. <laughs> the childhood hero of all time. That bloke, he was an one absolute great, legend. Yeah, one of the great men, Kevin. And still, still proudly has the brown low around his... Um, around his neck which is fantastic he actually offered me the opportunity to wear it i went to i'm a brisbane fitzroy supporter and and saw him at a family day and he offered me the opportunity to wear it around my neck 
and I just couldn't. It'd be <laughs> like meeting the Pope and the Pope saying, here, stick this hat on. <laughs> it just it just felt so wrong. And yet the person behind me absolutely lapped it up. So it, it's, it's different strokes, different folks. But this is about Peter Crimmins. Let's get back. Hey, uh, Dan, we had the privilege of uh, speaking on our show with David Parkin a few weeks ago about the passing of the late, great John Kennedy. And I was thinking about diverse coaching uh, of diverse personalities. And you think about that awesome... Hawthorne Foursome, the completely unusual Don Scott, uh, Michael Tuck, who didn't speak, a, a focused and determined Lee Matthews, and then this um, Peter Cribbins, who was um, still very hard and tough and clear footballer, but, you know, this wonderful, effervescent, bubbly, funny personality, completely diverse group of four that Kennedy have to look after. It it, it just goes to show uh, the, the importance of being able to, to deal with all different characters. Yeah, and I wrote a one of the chapters is called The Art of Roving and I looked into the 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 role Crimo played and alongside Lee and, and I spoke with Barry Rowlings and Bob Skilton and um, Barry Cable and Ross Smith, all these great rovers and just asked them about uh, roving to Don Scott and what, what was the setup in the centre? Did Kennedy have any plans? And <laughs> and Lee Matthews told me, uh, no, I just stood where I thought the ball was going to go and I, I realised that I probably needed to... Don was going to win against his opponent, so I went and stood here. Or Bob Skilton said, you know, I knew we might not win every hit out, so I followed the opposition ruckman. And so there was no real um, science in the centre back then. It was all about your, your footy smarts and understanding who was who was on on any particular day. And Crimo, Crimo was the one out there. You're right, a couple of those guys wouldn't say much on the field, but Crimo was the one not, not quite as uh, demonstrative as, as Luke Hodge was, where you'd see him directing traffic but he was sort of doing that verbally and always you can see during the 1971 grand final there's vision at the start of centre bounces and Crimo's sort of directing where guys need to go and um, he was that sort of on-field leader that everyone just uh, stood taller playing alongside. I think the other thing my recollection of him is is not quite as as sound as uh, Rob's because Rob's a lot older than me (laughs) I only remember seeing him on TV I probably saw him play live once maybe you know that sort of thing but I always remember him as being very slight you wouldn't look at him and think he's going to be a bustling coming through you know Lee Matthews kind of player he he must have relied heavily on his elusive behaviors as well as his uh, footy skills yeah definitely I think growing up so tiny compared to a lot of his teammates there's some photos there's a photo in the book of him um, and under uh, under 11's team, I think it was in up at Shepparton, and he he looks like he's five years old, and everyone else is 15. You know, he's a tiny kid, but um, so I think that probably helped from a very early age teach him that he needed to find ways to get in and out of traffic without getting hit by the big blokes. So mm. he certainly didn't mind copping the bumps, but he he obviously worked out how to manoeuvre himself. And Bob Keddy, his teammate, tells me how he would ride bumps and sort of brace himself to ride it and use that momentum to bounce off and run away so he was quite clever in that sense and um, I think when John Kennedy and, and Brendan Edwards took on the, the commando training at uh, the end of 1967 um, I think that was a time when uh, Crimo really bulked up, there's some vision of him around that time where he is it's just raw muscle, even though he's not a big solid bloke like Lee Matthews um, he still had that real he was one of the strongest blokes in the gym, like um, Bob Ketty tells me. He was he was doing leg weights and, and doing um, bench presses as, as, as good as most players in the club, despite his size. So he was, he was probably deceiving how, how strong he was. A bit like Michael Tuck was very much the same, wasn't he? He was very wire, wiry. There's a word wiry. we can use this morning. Um, Lee Matthews uh, mentioned that he never really had a relationship outside of the the ground with Don Scott or Michael Tuck really they um, they just came together and worked beautifully um, did he speak about a relationship at all with Peter Crimmins or w- again was that just a, a working relationship they had and nothing more no no Lee said that the he said Peter Crimmins and his wife Gwen were like the glue of the Hawthorne footy club they were the they were the sticking point of keeping everyone together and it was it was a common thing throughout Crimmins entire time at Hawthorne that Saturday nights, Sundays, there'd, there'd always be people at the Crimmins household, um, whether they were doing working bees or just hanging out watching the VFA on TV or whatever it might be. They were they were always together, and Crimo's house seemed to be the centrepiece of that. Even though they were out in the eastern suburbs, um, they, was, they still seemed to all head out that way. Lee, Lee and his first wife, Maureen, they were out there quite regularly, actually, and they were really good friends. And 
Um, everyone was there. Yeah, you, it's a it's a who's who of Hawthorne royalty. If you were a next door neighbour and you had an autograph book, you would have had a great time in the late sixties, early seventies, because Trimo was the the centrepiece of the social fabric of the club and and a real critical element of what what we know as the family club today. And the two boys, uh, I've got a recollection that one of them may have even played in the Hawthorne seconds at some stage. Were they footballers of note? Did they go on and play footy themselves or were they a bit burdened by the surname of Crimmins? Uh, yeah, Ben and Sam. Ben Ben played under-19s at the Hawks. He couldn't quite get onto the senior list, but he, he, he played really well. Both went to Assumption College where Peter and Peter's father had both gone as well. And uh, they, were, they were very good footballers, committed um, Sam, Sam probably less committed than Ben. He, he said he was a bit allergic to pre-seasons, but he was a very talented player and, and particularly talented cricketer. Um, and Ben just gave everything of himself, but just didn't quite get to that next level. But um, he played really well for Assumption there. So they did, they did carry a bit of a burden. In, in When Peter passed away in 1976, the Hawthorne left the jumper in, in the locker um, in the hope that one day Ben or Sam mm. might take it up. So there's a, there's a fair bit of pressure on you there to follow in Dad's shoes. And they were always compared to Peter. There'd always be photos growing up of them in their Hawthorne jumpers and, you know, Peter would be proud and Peter this and this. And it's like, well, there's a lot of pressure to put on these kids, you know, like it's not quite, not fair. But they, for the most part, they handled it okay. I think there was times when it did wear them down, particularly Ben. Um, but... Yeah, and then when it got to the point when they realised that it wasn't going to get to that next level, um, Sam certainly played some good footy out in the suburbs, I think in the Eastern Eastern Footy League. And, yeah, so they were they were good footballers, but not quite at Peter's level. And, uh, and as I said, yeah, Sam didn't quite have uh, Peter's training ethic. <laughs> tell you what, if they played footy at Assumption, you know how it gets cold down in Lee and Gather? You have not lived until you've been to a Saturday morning year nine football match against Assumption <laughs> College at Kilmore, as I have done on one or two occasions. It is the coldest place in the universe. And of course, if you're the stupid dad who goes up in the car, you're the goal umpire because the others all send their kids on the bus. <laughs> I, um, yeah, my brother lives at Ballarat and we used to say this was pretty cold there, but I went and did a bit of a bit of a mission to, to kill more, to do a bit of research, and yes, you're right, that, that, that goes to a new level again. Oh, it is a shock. Uh, Dan, that horrible 1976 season where Peter passed away after the, the grand final, uh, I guess there would have been a lot of talk amongst the players of the emotional impact that had on them, and there would have been some negative as well as the, the positive of going through the finals knowing that they were playing for Peter. Um, how, how was that period remembered by the players, but also uh, also Gwen? Yeah, firstly on the players, I think it's, it gets lost a bit, but it's quite a remarkable feat to win that premiership given what was happening to their best friend and their captain. You know, so many of them called Crimo their best friend. I don't know how many you can technically have, but so many <laughs> he had so many of them. And from Peter Knight, Brian Duke, Kevin Heath, and the list goes on and on. And um, the fact that they were able to keep performing all year, particularly second half of the year when it was clear that Peter's health was going downhill, and then by the time it got to the finals. You, you realised it was probably not he was not coming back. So the fact that they storm into the pre, into the grand final and then have all that weight of expectation on them and and then know that their mate is really really struggling um, to be able to achieve what they did was quite amazing and a testament to Kennedy and and David Parkin who was assistant coach and and the leaders at the club who were able to just stay focused somehow. But uh, and then on grand final day, John Kennedy reads out the telegram from Crimo and dare say uh, there wouldn't have been a dry eye in the room at that time but and the guy said John didn't have to raise his voice we just knew what we were going to do and good luck trying to beat us that day so they just had this steely resolve to win it for Crimo as much as for themselves and for the footy club but so many Peter Knight said you know it could have had the emotional effect on us and we we lose that game but it actually went the other way and it was all about we will win this for Crimo so the players were really strong in that sense Gwen on the other hand she had to be enormously strong in the other sense because she's seeing him go downhill and she's her and her sister, Lynn, who fortunately was a nurse, um, was able to come and, and look after Peter in those last couple of weeks because there was no palliative care for them back then. So Lynn and Gwen were, were it, basically. And, and, you know, so they had to deal with it day after day and it was just really difficult watching this former 
you know, um, picture of physical fitness going down and down. And, and, and Gwen said he was just so chuffed that day when they won that premiership. He sat up, somehow listened to it all day on the radio. He was quite sick, but he managed to get through the game. And then when the guys take the cup back that night, he's uh, he's sitting out with a big grin on his face and watching the replay on TV. So it was... It was. It really was like he held on for that last, last premiership, which was yeah. Just adds to the mythology around that. Yeah, and in Gwen's case too, not only the, the loving wife who would have been dealing with her own personal issues, but she would have been well aware of the impact on the players because if she lived with the players all during the, the happy times, she, she'd have been well aware of, of the impact that he was having on the, on them. So I suppose she was using that as some sort of a positive. Yeah. Well, in a way, it was good in a way it was bad because it didn't allow her to really um, analyse and assess the the full impact of what was happening because she had to be strong for everyone else. So, so many people would walk in to, to see Peter knowing it might be the last time and they'd come out and bawl their eyes out and she'd have to be the strong one sitting out there nursing them I guess and, and mm. saying it's going to be okay and you know we'll get through this and so she didn't get the chance to really sit down and bawl her own eyes out you know it was a really about ploughing on and that I think that affected her as the years went on which was really hard to see and I got to witness that a fair bit when writing writing the book and um, she had to be strong for everyone including the kids for so long and it, I think eventually it, it caught up with her which if she had have had today's um, uh, support networks around her it might have been a different story in terms of how she would have been able to maybe cope with it but it at the time, yeah, she was the one who had to pat the teammates on the back and say, it's OK, uh, you know, we'll get through it. So it was really, really tough for her on so many levels, yeah, and obviously seeing the love of her life fading away. Uh, Dan, was this one of your favourite of the 12 projects? Yeah, they all have their own... A bit like having 12 kids. You you, you, you like most of them, don't you? Say? Oh, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, it, it was a real privilege to, to write it, and I, certainly the most... Uh, sensitive story I've had to approach so there's lots of uh, typing deleting retyping just to get those precise words because you really you knew you were dealing with people's lives here and their emotional states and it was a really important story that had to be told including the medical side of it which I delved into Peter's brother Bernie is a doctor and I also spoke with Dr Ben Tran at the Peter McCallum Clinic to get some real insights on the medical side of things to see causes and effects and, and treatments available at the time and the sad thing is if, if Crimo contracts that cancer maybe five or six years later he, he may possibly still be here that's how fast it, it yeah. ends after his passing so it was just he was a victim of his time unfortunately uh, Have you got your next project on the table yet? Yeah it seems they're trying to rope me in at Hawthorne. I've got a Peter Hudson biography in the works and uh, also a book on the Hawthorne-Melbourne merger, failed merger. So there's a couple of Hawthorne projects on the go. So hopefully Hawthorne people like me after all this or else I might not ever be welcomed back into the club. <laughs> now, the name of the book is Crimo, the story of Peter Crimmins. must take you a while to come up with the name of that. Um, it is available presumably online uh, in both printed and electronic form? Yep, definitely. Slatterymedia.com. Uh, daneddybooks.com and Hardy Grant and all hardygrant.com and also the Hawthorne Hawks Nest uh, the merchandise shop there and it's also uh, available ebook style I think if not yet very soon um, but yeah every every all your good bookstores all your bad ones too there there's not there's no bad ones is there so well no, there's no bookshops at the moment they're all closed <laughs> well that's true so jump onto one of those websites and uh, we'll make sure we get a uh, a copy to you ASAP. No, that's good stuff. Good. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we'll catch up at some stage for a glass of something cool on a warm afternoon at Bears Otago Hotel in Lee and What do you say? Nice work by you. Nice research. Uh, you know, my daughter lives Brian, in Menian. You're obviously <laughs> sponsored by the Bears, so I did not <laughs> plug the other pub. But it just so happens that Jared Ruffhead uh, co-owns the other pub in town, the McCartan's Hotel. So the top. oh, there you go. Now my daughter used to teach in Lee and Gather, and she lives in Menian. So. Um, Oh, there you go. That's how I know the area now, how cold it is. Dan, thanks for joining us on uh, Two Blacks Chatting Radio Show and all the very best with sales of your book. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks Good work, Dan. Thank you very much. There he is, Dan Eddy uh, of Lee and Gatha, who has written uh, the Crimo story. So, um, yeah, a, a really interesting story about uh, someone who is, you know, we've talked a bit about who would like to have a beer with at, at each club, and uh, he would be one of the Hawthorne ones, I suspect, that people would come up with. Yeah, he was um, uh, similar to... Robert Flower and Simon Black, people that 
played at clubs and while they were beating you up, you didn't really mind them going well mm. because they were just clearly good people, had all the right principles, never belted anyone, did nothing wrong, just, just really great characters. And yeah, I can remember how it impacted me. I didn't necessarily like Hawthorne that much, but uh, his loss certainly impacted on anyone who loved footy in those days.